Videos from Madison Plus UX made possible by Adorable IO. Hello, I am I am Donna, and uh, I like I like Post-it notes. Probably as many of you in the audience also like Post-it notes. I come from. New York City from Brooklyn. I always end up in the Midwest for some reason. I spent way too many years in the Midwest, uh, part of which I'll talk to you about today. And um, yeah, I think what we're gonna talk about is something that I've been thinking about for many, 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 many years while I was kind of working on other things. So what are those, those other things? I've worked in tech for about 15 years helping businesses, companies, small businesses, large startups, educational institutions, build awesome digital things. And I'm not, full disclosure, I'm not really a designer, not a developer, kind of don't do anything. I've played both on TV <laughs> many times in the past. I, yes, I can code. No, I don't code on a daily basis. But I kind of kick people in, in the butt. I, I instigate, I ask a lot of questions, I get teams and individuals unstuck, and I make sure that they really understand what it is that they're building and that it's solving actual problems. And before I was doing tech stuff, I was kind of doing something actually very similar, but for many years I thought it was so different from tech and I couldn't figure out how the two fit, but a long, long time ago, I was actually a filmmaker. That is actually what my training I is in. I spent um, uh, about seven years studying film, making documentary films, and uh, a lot of that was, was in the Midwest, of course. And when you're in film school, you do this stuff, like storyboarding. Now, in tech, we talk a lot about storyboarding these days. People got really excited a few years ago. A bunch of people started talking about, hey, there are all these techniques that you can use in film and, and you know, transpose to digital. We're going to create awesome, awesome things. And so we started doing these, these, these kind of comic things. This is something that Hitchcock was a master at. Basically, the idea is that you sketch out every single frame of what you're going to build before you go out and build it, it helps you save money, time, stress, and you look good when you're on set and people are hungry and tired and cranky and you know exactly where the camera's gonna go. So storyboarding, great for film, how about let's, let's use it for digital stuff, awesome. So we have these things that we call scenarios, sometimes we add little sketches to them. We use it a lot in user-centered design and goal-driven design. Awesome, so I was doing that too. Storyboarding, comics, hey, let's designate sketches as part of our spec. When we want to actually indicate to a developer how this thing is going to animate, let's sketch. Great, cool, I was doing that too, right? All, all second nature, great. Comics, the other thing that we call storyboards. Hey, let's draw out a scenario of use. Show someone using our product. Help us wrap our heads around how people might use this thing. Great, this is what, again, I did for many years as a filmmaker. Second nature, awesome. Now, the thing about all these techniques that we in tech have borrowed from film is that, for, for me, I'm just going to be completely honest. What I ended up creating over many, many years, not all the time, but it was kind of hit or miss. Often, I'd create things that were you know, kind of flat, not really very exciting, so a lot of times we'd have low conversion, we'd have low activation, low engagement, we'd have funnel drop off, let's say it's a sign up flow and people weren't finishing their sign up, and I just really couldn't figure out what was, what was going on. Sometimes the stuff that we were building was awesome, it worked, met everyone's needs, and sometimes it, it just, it, it wasn't. And so I decided to, to go back and kind of look at, at the, the core of what I was doing in tech and comparing it to what I did as a filmmaker, because I realized that in film, I also had hits and, and misses. The films I made were never, ever, ever consistent. Either they would win awards, they would win grants, people loved them, I would get praise, it felt awesome, 
great, I went to grad school for free, very happy times, or they were terrible. And I would have classmates, professors, you know, other people just tell me, oh my God, why did you make us just sit through that? <laughs> So, they, you know, they would act, I've actually been told that was boring. <laughs> what was the point, you know? And so I would get that a lot, and I just kind of yeah, shrugged it off, whatever. I always had a job in, in tech at the end of the day, so it didn't really, didn't really matter. But when I started actually thinking about, okay, this thing, storyboarding, there's, I, know, I knew there was something to it because it was the only thing I absolutely ever did on every film that I ever worked on. So I started trying to figure out, you know, what worked, what didn't work? Was there a, a trick to this thing? And can it work for, for digital things, tech things that we build? And so what I realized is that, you know, we're, we're talking about storyboarding, which is a technique, but you can't have storyboarding without the story. And all of my films in my past that worked, the one common thread is that they all had a very solid story. It was accidental. I learned week one of school how to craft a story. I'm going to teach you how to do that. But I never paid attention. And I kind of accidentally would do it and accidentally would not do it. So the thing about stories is there um, luckily is, is a formula for that. It's actually really easy to craft a story. And I know a lot of people, especially in tech these days, and especially in the business world too, are talking about story, story, everyone needs to be a storyteller. And that's great, but no one ever teaches you how to tell a story. In, in film school though, they teach you how to tell a story. And if you're a good student, you pay attention. And if you're not like me, then you, you forget it. But there is a way to make sure that everything flows nicely, that people are engaged. It's kind of, again, all about engagement. That's what the movies do, that's what TV does, and that's what we're often doing when we're building digital things that people need to use. We need to engage our audience, our users. So <clears throat> I started trying to apply this concept, and it's a completely made-up name. I'm calling it story mapping, because it's literally mapping out all the points of a story in order to plan what it is that you're going to build. <clears throat> I started trying to use this in tech to see, OK, does, does it work? And you know, yes, I, I will show you many cases where it does work. But I kind of also just borrowed this from things that were already being done. So TV, TV writers' rooms. I don't know if any of you are super, I know we have a lot of nerds in the audience, but if any of you are super nerds, you know who this guy, guy is. OK, I see some. Some hands. So this is Vince Gillian. He's one of the showrunners of Breaking Bad. And that's season four behind him, the story map of season four. TV writers understand that you have to map out every single thing. Writing is not just genius. Storytelling is not genius. It's very, very, very carefully planned out. And yes, they also use post-it notes like we do, which is awesome, although they put them on cork boards. So that's Brian Cranston and one of the show's writers, and they're looking at character maps, maps of their stories. All right? It's all very planned out. What I want to just mention is if any of you have a developer background and use Agile user stories, which is a tool that I absolutely love and I use all the time, I just want to sort of uh, show that this is not the same thing, although it might look kind of similar. Yes, there are post-its, and yes, there are you know, timelines and stuff happening. But it's, it's more like TV. So it's more like a way to make things go boom. This is a close-up of season four, Breaking Bad. Hopefully that's not a spoiler for anyone, but <laughs> Right? They're in the job, they're in the business of making things go boom. And so are we, and we can plan this stuff out. So I'm going to kind of walk you through the anatomy of a story, because again, like I was saying, it's, it's, it's pretty simple to do. It's what we learn on week one of, of film school, and it's something you can all take home today and basically run with and start having, having fun with. So the core of a good story is what we call the narrative arc. And every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So the x-axis here is time. 
Now, stuff happens. Literally, these are called plot points. They are points plotted out. So if you ever wonder why they're called plot points, right? The y-axis is, is kind of awesomeness. Stuff gets more and more awesome or interesting over time, and then it kind of calms down towards the end. So if you break down plot points, and this is pretty much true for any story ever, unless maybe it's an avant-garde, you know, those, those have different rules and, or no rules, and that's okay. But you have the beginning, which we call the exposition, and that's where you are introduced to the characters, where they are, and during this point, all is usually good in the world because it makes it all that more juicy when something bad happens, which happens very, very, very quickly. That's what we call the inciting incident. And in digital product land, we often call this a problem. We, you know, that's something that we always say, what's the problem that we're solving, this feature? What problem does it solve? The users, what problem do they have, right? So this is the inciting incident. It's a problem that the main character has very early on. It's what makes us get engaged super early in this story. Stuff happens, it gets more and more exciting over time. Usually this is some kind of a journey, a chase, or a search. Often, around three quarters towards the end, there is a crisis. This is when something kind of bad happens, gets thrown in to throw us a little bit off track and make us wonder, oh my god, is the main character going to meet their goal? So often, I, I like to think of buddy movies. This is when the buddies get into a big fight. And it's usually kind of funny. You know, they're probably going to make up, but you don't know how. You don't know what's going to happen. The climax, just the high point, something cool happens. It makes you glad that you stayed. And it makes it that much more awesome that the crisis was overcome. And then fo falling action. We have to have resolution. As humans, we like closure. We want to feel good at the end. If there's no closure, that's OK. It's called a cliffhanger. So it's only, j just so you know, only once I started actually thinking about this that I realized what cliffhangers were. And that's when you end at the, the crisis. You can do that, but it's a cliffhanger. You're gonna, it's a different kind of experience and something more like a serial or like one of my favorite, uh, <laughs> favorite movies, an example I love to, to give. So uh, has anyone here ever not seen Back to the Future? Just to, okay, I see two hands. You guys have homework, but everyone else can, <laughs> can uh, take this example. So you have the beginning of the movie. It's the exposition. You meet Doc, you meet Marty. Cool, there's a time machine. Awesome, great. Uh-oh. Something bad happens. The plutonium that Doc stole, the Libyans want to you, you know, get it back, and they, they shoot him. It's very bad. So what happens? Well, Marty just ha has to save the day now. So he now has a goal. It's to save Doc and, and, and save the world. He goes back into time. All this crazy stuff happens. He meets his mom. She falls for him. It gets weird and on and, <laughs> and, and on and weirder and weirder. And he's a lot closer to actually, you know, meeting his goal. More stuff happens. And then something happens to throw everyone off. His hand starts disappearing. He can't play Johnny Be Good. It's terrible. Oh my God, how's this going to end? Well, fear not. It all worked out. He got his parents to kiss at the dance and wonderful, but there's more because you can't have a movie just end with a, a kiss or it would be an avant-garde movie. You still have to close it up <laughs> somehow. So, okay, falling action. He still has to get home. In this case, there's, they're li literally falling action, which is why I love it, falling from a tower and, you know, stuff happens. The resolution, he ends up home. Great. This is often when movies end up, or where you end up. You end up home. And again, it's not very dissimilar from something, let's say, like an onboarding or a new user sign-up flow. You often take people through a journey, and they end up home. Just like Back to the Future, it's often a different kind of home than where they started. And then they have to learn something new. And then there's a new reason for them to use the product. We often call this logged-in home. So again, this walks you through a little bit of the structure. Now, <coughs> billions of dollars, great. What if we're not making Hollywood movies? Ernest Hemingway, 
And there's a rumor, no one knows if it's true, that he was, uh, there was a wager between he and a friend. Could he create a story in, in six words? And his answer was, yeah, of course, no problem. So his, his story, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. Now, it, it pretty much has it all. You don't need millions and millions of dollars, you don't need actors, you don't need anything to tell a story. So again, it's doable in small bits. You can also tell a story with an image. So this, it's an Apple product. Anyone wanna take a guess as to what the product might be? Yeah, yeah, pretty much FaceTime. No, notice how no one said Siri. <laughs> And I could go on and on about, <laughs> about Siri, but uh, I used to actually, when I taught this, I teach a lot actually at uh, um, universities and, and uh, uh, I call them kids, I know they're not kids, but when I've, I've taught this before, I used to use Siri as an example and I realized, oh, that story makes no sense. What was I, what was I thinking? You know, we do by our own stories, but yeah, FaceTime, there is a clear story there that you can infer really, really, really quickly. So what I wanna walk you through are the three different types of stories that I've found through the years that pretty much are universal across digital products. Again, these are websites, apps, even landing pages, sign-up flows, digital things that we build. And actually, I'm starting to find it even works towards uh, um, physical spaces and marketing strategies, and it can kind of work for, for anything. But UX stories, we've got epic stories, origin stories, and usage stories. So I'm gonna walk you through each of these. So epic stories, the way I like to think about stories and why you would ever use stories in your work is that they answer questions that you may have. If you don't have a question at any point in your design process, then there's no need to craft a story. But if you do have a question, it's a great way to prototype a solution. So. Epic stories, these are big. So it's questions like, what is this product or feature? Why should users even care or want to use it? So the way that I've seen these epic stories work is you have the current state of things, you have a user problem, stuff happens, the crisis is optional, maybe the crisis is something in the user's head of just the competition. What else is out there that they would prefer to use? The climax, the high point, it's often just the value, the coolness factor, oh, this is awesome. And what this means for you, so you, the user, they still have to meet their goal and they have to go from, oh, that's so cool, to, wow, my life's gonna be better, or something like that. So the way I like to think about this is it kind of is structured like a good elevator pitch. So usually that's something like for target customer who has this need, that's a problem. The product is a type of product that has one key benefit. Unlike the competition, it does this. So walk you through an example, the, the iPhone. So that, you know, when it came out, a lot of us had phones, cell phones, and iPods, and you know, we joke about duct taping them together, how it's so annoying to have two devices, but it really wasn't that bad. It wasn't that big of a deal. And so, you know, the story starts out, okay, I love my iPod. I love my cell phone. I don't love carrying two devices. It's not a huge global problem that anyone had since 1997. So, okay, we hear this thing, the iPhone's coming out. Cool, Steve Jobs knew this. This is actually a very similar story arc to what he uh, had structure his keynote presentation when he first introduced the first iPhone. So, great, it's, uh, it's you know, got a crisis, which is, I already have an iPod, I already have a cell phone, this thing's expensive, how are you gonna get me to buy it? And so, the climax is, the way he presented it at the keynote is, this is way better than an iPod or a cell phone. It's crazy easy to use. Because if you remember, this is when they introduced the touch screen. Touch screens were pain to use back then. Everyone hated it. Everyone thought, why is Apple so crazy? Yet, no, the answer was, no, 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 this is Awesome, just check it out. And it was, it was kinda, kinda true. And it did other stuff too, you could go on and on. But you know, it was an internet communicator. Oh my God, internet, no one even wanted that in the first place. But great, in the end, you have all your music and your phone all in one device and it's awesome. So 
The way to think about these epic stories is they're good for uncovering how a product fits into users' lives. You can sort of test out hypotheses around product market fit, which is why would anyone care about this? And you can also figure out what a product MVP is. This is minimum viable product, because if you think about the first iPhone, it didn't do a whole lot. It didn't have apps, didn't have cut and paste, no one cared. It did what it needed to to have a good story. So this is epic, big. Origin stories. The way I like to think about these is the question of how might users find us, or what value or affordances do we show? So the general idea here is, first you start off, there's, there's who, who is, you know, who are we sort of focusing on, where are they, and this could be your personas, your target market. What, what's going on? Why might they use this? What is their problem? We also call this in behavioral psychology often a trigger in game design also. It's something, what's going to get them to use it in the first place? Then you sort of dig into, all right, how are people going to find us? Is it going to be word of mouth? Is it going to be paid advertising? Google search through the app store. There are a million different ways people can find you. All of them are a very different story. In this case, eh, there might be a crisis, there might not be. Don't always have to worry about it. Then the, the climax is sort of why should anyone care about this product? What's awesome about it? And this climax is what you have to show on whatever touch point the users are finally going to first experience your products. So if it's a home page, a landing page, or in the app store, you have to tell people why this is going to be great. And then they take an action, and their goal is met, and your business goal is met. So you've acquired a new user, or you've activated them, on and on. So I'm going to give you a really simple example. We have Pinterest. This was the first Pinterest email that I ever got. This is when all the dudes in Silicon Valley and tech a few years ago were saying, what the hell is this Pinterest thing? Who cares? This is stupid. Why are people signing up? I don't get it. And on and on. But <laughs> those of you who had a problem that Pinterest was solving, like myself, it was, it was a no-brainer. A simple, ugly email with one line of text grabbed me in immediately. And so I'm just going to read off, um, hi, uh, or check out my stuff on Pinterest. Hi, I set up a Pinterest profile where I can share the things I like and want you to follow me so you can see it, exclamation point. Once you join Pinterest, you'll be able to create your own collections and share your taste. So the story here, at the time, I collected images of things and I shared images. I wanted to paint my apartment. I didn't know what color. I was cataloging images, sharing them with my friends, and it was a pain. It was not fun, but that's what I did. I started hearing about Pinterest through word of mouth, through Twitter, through email, other channels, and then the climax of my story in this case was that someone wanted to share something visual with me. That's all. Just in it being visual, it was an oh my god moment. Because this is when Delicious was around. Remember Delicious or browser bookmarks? So great. I signed up and in the end it was as simple as I collected something all within the same story. My first time use. I, they made me collect something and share something. So I saw the value. I didn't just see it, but I experienced the value. So if you look at, again, the email, a couple of key points. I can share things I like. You can see them. That's pretty much all they had to say. And they had me. And they had millions of other people who were flocking to the system in, in, in swarms. So. Stuff like this, right? The origin story, it's good for landing page requirements, marketing, copy, assets, search engine optimiza optimization, calls to action. It's sort of, again, what's, wh why are people going to use this the first time? What's going to grab them in? So the last kind of story I'm going to talk you through is what I call usage stories. And these are the kind that resemble more what we traditionally call storyboards in film, which is just shot by shot by shot what's going on. So the question this answers is how should this flow flow, essentially? So the example that I like is, um, well, actually, I'm going to sort of break it down first. But you start off with the, you know, who is this for? Same thing. Who's our user? What, what's going on? Who, 
what's the context? And um, there's an incentive or a call to action. In this case, often users might not have a problem that they know about. Something has to be an inciting moment. There is rising action, the screen flow, stuff happens. There might be an impediment. There probably is if you're working on a payment flow. I can tell you what that impediment is. You can probably guess it's when you ask for the credit card and it could be you know, a million other things. You ask for a password, the list goes on and on. And the, the high point really is that the, there's some kind of experience value. You just make the user feel good during this flow. I'm gonna show you how. Then the flow has to end again. There's nothing worse than a sign-up form ending on a thank you page. It has to, again, take you somewhere, probably home, something like logged in home, and then you have to get people to do something. So the example I like to give for this is Twitter. Twitter, a few years ago, was trying to figure out why all these users were signing up for the service, but then dropping off like flies. They wouldn't actually engage with it over time. And so they tried to come up with a new onboarding flow. And what they ended up doing was making it a lot longer, but it worked a lot better. And this is, this is why. So you have the first page. There's an inciting incident. It's as simple as, welcome to Twitter, start a conversation, explore your interests, and be in the know. Being in the know, it's not really a problem, but it kind of is. We call it the fear of missing out something that taps into people. If they came to the Twitter homepage, they probably were wondering, what is this Twitter thing? So grab them in. Rising action, so stuff happens. They get you to start doing all of these things. And more stuff happens. You follow people, and, and you follow more people. <laughs> and about a few minutes later, you keep following people. And this is what I consider the crisis point where you're kind of getting a little bored. You're sitting there thinking, oh my god, how many more people are they going to make me follow? Now for Twitter, it's 15. That's what they found. Their data said if 15 people are now part of this user's network, they're going to engage with the service over time. If we don't get them to follow 15 the first time they use the product, they're going to drop off. So, all right, crisis. I'm a little bit bored. What's the point of this thing? Well, the way Twitter basically accounted for that is sort of the opposite of what, what you would think. They actually say, hey, cool, thanks. Now, find your friends. Your friends are probably here, and now they can be part of your network. And the funny thing of this being the high point of a flow like this is that if any of you have ever worked on onboarding flows that try to get people's information and try to get them to sign up via Facebook or other friends, this is usually the point where there's just funnel drop off like crazy. Everyone's like, oh God, no, click, I'm done. Not everyone, but a lot of, a lot of people. In this case, because you're so invested in all the work you've put in and you've already been finding a little bit of value and interesting things as you've been following people, it's kind of neat that your friends might be there. So, okay, cool, that's, that's neat. My friends are here too. And you get a little preview of, of you know, the fact that your friends might be there. So, all right, follow some friends. And then it still has to end somewhere. They can't kind of finish it off. And so in this case, the ending is, okay, you know, how about you finish your profile? You've already put so much work in. Give us your name. Give us some information. Join us. And then you're brought to logged in home. At that point, again, the data shows that you're so invested that you're, you're there. You're, you're, you're one of them. And if you break this down, the way this, this kind of works, so... You start off as a, a curious newbie. You're wondering, what is this thing? You kind of want to be in the know. You, okay, only 60 seconds, great. I'm going to get started, even though it's not 60 seconds. There's a crisis moment where you're kind of bored. What am I doing? Why am I doing this again? Oh, I can get you know, a taste of in the know, and my friends are here. That's kind of cool. And then, you know, just because it has to end, at that point, resistance is futile. You'll probably give them your, you know, I, I always have nerd references in my talk. So you're going to, you know, they're, you're going to add your, your biological data and <laughs> you're going to be put one of the Borg and, and it's done. Twitter has you. They've, they've grabbed you in. You go home. You're in the know. Awesome. End. So... A flow like this, again, this is a usage flow. This is really mapping out a good story onto step by step by step. 
So it can help you figure out macro and micro flows, things like onboarding, first time use. You can optimize for conversion and activation. It's a fancy way of saying, again, why would people want to do this? And uh, you can use it for payment checkout flows, long time enga long term engagement and retention. And the thing I want to say, in terms of mapping stories out, right? Did Pinterest sit there, map a story out? No. Did Twitter sit there, map a story out? No. Pretty much. Did I sit there, map a story out when I was in, in undergrad and in grad school making films? Most of the time, no. And it's kind of hit or miss, but I've gone through so many flows and reversed engineered arcs, and the successful ones flow like a good story. This, is, this formula is kind of something that has been around with us for millennia, and it's something that has just traveled through the ages with us. It's kind of the key to engagement. So, you know, does it mean if you don't map out a story, you're always going to have a dud? Of course not. I don't always outline articles before I write them, although the ones that I outline are probably going to be better. Sometimes it's internal, but what matters is if it's not internal to you to be an amazing storyteller, just think about mapping it out. You'll probably have success because every time I've actually consciously done this with a team in the last few years, we've had an amazing success. And if we haven't, we've been able to pivot immediately and know exactly what the problem with the story was. Usually it meant that our research data was a little bit off and we didn't actually know the story like we thought it did. Because a lot of this should be based on what we know about our users and their goals, behaviors. So, I do want to just sort of mention again, in terms of how you create these stories, it really, there's no best, pra well, there's one best practice that I'll tell you about, but they can be written, we call them scenarios. I find these tend to get very long-winded very quickly, and every student, every client who's ever written a scenario has lost the big picture. It's a cliche for a reason, they've lost the story, so don't always recommend it early on. You can have comics, you can have very fancy comics. Again, same thing, it's not anything without a good story. You can just diagram it. And the teens I work with and the students that they teach have the best luck with a simple diagram, at least early on, because they actually are paying attention to what the structure is. So I would say always diagram first, then go fancy and whatever method will continue to answer questions that you have. So if a simple diagram is how you're starting, great. You might move on to a matrix that's the size of an entire wall where you start filling in requirements and okay, this plot point needs five things and you might have multiple stories if you have multiple users, each persona probably gets a few stories. I like to include story arcs in persona one sheets or in this case it was a a two sheet, but no one ever read the first sheet and they all jump to the second sheet and that's often what I find, no one reads personas, but they'll look at your diagrams and they get it immediately. You can use it as part of a strategic engagement. I've done story mapping workshops where it's an entire week and we map out an entire product and have an entire roadmap and strategy for the next three months. So again, there's no right or wrong way to map out stories. What matters is that you're always asking yourself and um, you know part of why we didn't explain sort of what my job was earlier is my, my job is kind of to ask what's the story it's pretty much what I do with clients and and students I'm just a pain in the butt and you know you just want to ask yourself what's what's your story what's the story here why would anyone ever want to use this what's going on so specifically you can it's kind of a cheat sheet but who's the hero what is their big goal you must know this. How might the story play out? So again, there are a million different ways the story can play out. And what is required to make this happen? Because the thing you want to remember, again, stories are not just about stuff happening, sign-up flows for the sake of sign-up flows. It, it's kind of the, I'd say that the fourth question is, how can we make this go boom? And remember, think back to TV writers, studios. This is, this is what they're, this is what they're doing. This is what they always do. There's no reason why we shouldn't be doing this too. Because if we do this, we might be able to, and this I promise is my last nerd reference, but we might be able to <laughs> make these never-ending stories if that's what your business or product wants to do. And, and that's pretty awesome. So 
Thank you very much.